And as the riders prepare for the start this morning, this is the rather dreary scene on top at Guzé Neige. Low cloud and fine rain. Well, sadly for us all, one rider who won't see this mountain today is Sean Yates, the British rider retiring yesterday on the road to Ravel. Gary Imlac reports. While the rest of the Motorola team bikes were being prepared for today's stage, number 119s had already been hung up in the mechanic's truck. And after some consolation from the backup crew, Sean made things official. As far as the tour's concerned, it's been hung up for good. Definitely. I mean, last year I said, I've said a few times that it's the last year, but... You know, last year everything was rosy, this year wasn't so rosy and I mean, I, if I didn't ride the Tour this year I would have said I should have done it, but I, I gave it a go and, you know, it's, you, get, you, have to, you get to a point when obviously things get do start getting too hard and, and the Tour is the hardest race in the world and there's no let up and there's no room for the week, you know, and there's, they're down to 130 riders already after two weeks, so it shows how hard it is. So where are you off to from here then? I think I'm going to go back down to Nice for a week and then back home to England. So I've just got to rest up and hopefully it repairs itself quickly and so I'm ready for the Leeds Classic. Will you be watching the Charles de Lise stage on telly? I'll be watching all the stages on telly. I love watching bike riding on telly. <laughs> <laughs> and there's still a week of viewing left, Sean, so enjoy it. The 164 kilometres route today leaves saint laurent de Gabville outside of Toulouse with the serious climbing beginning about 45 kilometres from the end. Another birthday on the Tour de France for Miguel Indurain this morning, and he turns 31, showing no signs of slowing down. Overall, he leads this race by 2 minutes and 44 seconds ahead of Alex Zula. Laurent Jalabert lies third, Bjorn Arise is fourth, Melchor Maury is fifth. Tony Rominger is there in sixth place, Marco Pantani is eighth, and Max Chiandri, the only British rider left in the Tour, is in 47th position. And on the rollout this morning, the field reduced now by 60 riders since they left Sambria in Brittany two weeks ago. Sergei Uchikov gave the Palti team their raison d'etre yesterday, but it'll be one of survival for him today, I would think. And the sprinting underway early after just 23 kilometres. Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov continuing this great battle for the green jersey. Led out by Eric Decker, he snatches the points. Laurent Jalapur, the holder of the green jersey, took third. A cooler day in store for the riders of the Tour de France with a high of only 20 degrees Celsius. But the low cloud in the mountains could result in a thunderstorm later in the afternoon. And the second sprint of the day, that came after 109 kilometres at Niort. And in fact, three riders just ahead of the field here, jean Cyril Robin of Festina, Dante Arezze of the Aki team and Martin Dembaca of TVM. They didn't even contest the sprint, they went over in that order. And now we can join the race live on the lower slopes of the Port de la. And just look at this now. Tony Rominger is among the first riders to attack here on this second category climb. And he is at the moment 27 seconds behind two leaders because Dante Retze has been dropped by jean Cilly Robin and Martin Denbacher. But clearly today, Paul, Tony Rominger has decided to come out and see exactly what he can do. He's been joined here by the teammate of Indurain, Gonzalez Arietta. Definitely decided that he wants to show himself. He's had a very tough time in this year's Tour de France, and I think he knows that the climbs are not too difficult today. He can use the power that he's got, and he's so far behind Miguel Indurain that Indurain is not going to chase him down dramatically as he would do normally. And look at this, here he comes, and he's going a couple of mountains early today. We're sorry about the picture breakup with the quality. We obviously have a problem here in the mountains in the Pyrenees, but we saw briefly there an attack by Marco Pantani. And he has flown away. There he is, the third man here. And he never waits for anybody on the slopes. He's going straight past Tony Romiger, who will wonder who has just arrived and gone by. This man is such a class above everybody else on the mountains. And look at that there. Tony Romiger looked across to see if he could just accelerate a little bit to stay with Marco Pantani. But Pantani just dances on the pedals and goes away and opens the gap straight away. This man has got to be, as you said a couple of days ago, the best climber in the world. Well, the interesting thing was that Rominger made no effort to get onto the wheel of Pantani, but to continue the attack at his own pace. And another man, an interesting move, who is in there as well. You can just see the pale, light blue jersey there of the Gaywiz squad. I should think very much that is likely to be Ivan Gotti, the early wearer of the yellow jersey in this year's Tour de France. These riders here at the moment are not opening up a big gap over the jersey of Miguel Indurain at the moment. 
In fact, if anything, the Bonesto team are dragging the Miguel back up to the group here. They're going much, much more quicker, and you can see them coming up now. The Mape boys, this is the first time, Paul, really, we've seen the Mape team try to help Rominger. It is the first time, but I think the reason is because it's the first time that Tony Rominger himself has felt like racing, but his team aren't strong enough to come up and help him at the moment because they've actually been quite decimated. He lost a couple of good riders early on, Carlo Bowmans and Javier Morlion, the rider who often was with him in the mountains, but they can't match the speed in the mountains of this man. This little small man who sits right back in the saddle and just keeps his gears as low as he can, but the great thing about a climber is they spend a lot of time spurting forward, lifting the pace to the heights when nobody else can reach them. And then they sit down and hold that rhythm, then they're out of the saddle again. But look at this now as the group begins to slow down, because Rominger has seen Indurain coming up, and I think he might turn the gas off here. The gap to Pantani is half a minute. Well, again, you see Miguel Indurain has had total confidence in his team. He hasn't panicked. Once he's seen the climbers accelerating, he's let them go because, as we said, he doesn't have the acceleration to go quickly on a mountain like this. I feel quite certain it's because of his weight. He has the power, so he has to accelerate nice and slowly over a further distance and bring himself back into the frame. But Laurent Jalabert and Bjorn Aris, uh, Melchior Mari, they should be very concerned by this attack. They are much nearer in time difference to Pantani. Around about a six-minute gain today, and we could see uh, Pantani, as he said, into a podium position, a place in the top three in the classification. And now look at this, Paul. This is Bjorn Aris who's going clear, and that's because he is afraid that Pantani might eat into his fourth place in the classification. You see, he's six minutes down on Miguel Indurain, but he's six minutes, 38 seconds ahead only of Marco Pantani. So he's got to take the action himself, which is going to help Indurain indirectly. It will help him indirectly. And what's going to happen now, I feel sure, is that the Onse riders are going to take up the chase because they're lying in second and third place overall. And in fact, it was Laurent Jalabert with that superb move on Bastille Day that moved him up into third place ahead of Bjarne Ries. And what a move that is by Ries. He realizes there's 20 miles to go, 30 kilometers, and 20 kilometers of that is uphill. And Jalabert's going as well. This is an amazing Tour de France. Everybody fighting to protect their position in the overall classification. Jalabert has now been drawn into the fray as well. And here's the man who has thrown down the gauntlet today, Marco Pantani, tapping out his little message on the Pyrenees for the rest to come after him. And there you have Miguel Indurain leading the peloton. Most of the riders at the front are Anse and Bonesto. The Anse, of course, not chasing because they're hoping that Laurent Jalabert will go clear of this field. Although Jalabert seems to have slowed down in his tempo. Well, I think he looked ahead of him on the road and he saw that Bjarne Ries was actually moving away. He decided to conserve his energy a little bit because it may well be that in the back of the Anse mines, they want to attack in a couple of days' time when it's going to be a lot more difficult with some real major calls to go over. So Jalabert is back in the field now, just two riders ahead on the climb here of the Port de Lez. One kilometre now for Marco Pantani to the top of the second category climb, and that's all it is, even though it's caused so much damage, the Port de Lez. Then he will descend and then climb the Col d'Agnès and then the Col de la, la Trap before he finally goes up because he knows. There's the devil, he's always around somewhere every day. He horns someone, now he's chosen Marco Pantani. Strangely enough, Marco Pantani has a tattoo on his shoulder, which is a tattoo of the devil, and he was said the other day, well, how is it that you copy Claudio Chiapucci? You have a tattoo of the devil. He said, I had it a long time before Chiapucci did. <laughs> well, coming up to the top of this climb, you can see that, uh, in fact, Bjorn Aris, we haven't seen anything of Bjorn Aris. He's trapped in between this man Pantani and the bunch, but he is losing ground now, significantly so, uh, to Pantani. It's out now to 52 seconds and the peloton are closing in on Bjorn Aris. Concentration of the man the French have nicknamed the elephant, Marco Pantani, coming up towards the summit. And he's really concentrating now as he keeps those that superb rhythm going. Now a little sprint to the line, then he'll settle down for what is a difficult descent. And look at Injurain now, had enough, and Injurain is attacking here now. He's going to rip this field apart, he's going to have to go after Marco Pantani. Those who can go should go now. 
Definitely, that's what he does. He uses his teammates up until the very last minute. When there aren't any left with him, he puts down the hammer himself. And at the moment, there's one man just sticking right into the slipstream of Miguel Indurain, and that's Alex Zula. Just a little bit further back is Richard Virenk, trying to stay in contact there, but he's having an awful hard time. Well, there's been an explosion in this league group. The others are scrabbling for wheels, but Indurain now is charging towards the summit of the Port de l'Air. Richard Varenk spotted it, Azula has just hooked his braces, I think, over the back saddle of Indurain, and he's going to hang on until this man slows down. And I don't think Varenk is going to get into contact there, because where's Barney Rees? Bjarne Rees is there, and Miguel Indurain, over the last few hundred metres, has closed down that gap, and as Bjarne Rees looks back, Miguel Indurain is straight away in his slipstream. And Indurain is going to get second right on the line over the top of the climb, 48 seconds behind. So Indurain is second, uh, Reese will have gone over there third, followed by Zula in fourth place. The King of the Mountains has gone over as well in fifth, Virenk. Well, the, all the men are now on the way down who matter in this year's Tour de France, and just look at these conditions. There's going to be a lot to report on today's stage yet. We'll take a break. Britain's Robert Miller may not be in this year's race, but when the Tour came to Guzenej in 1984, he was the man of the day and the King of the Mountains. See you after the break. Miller was King of the Mountains and fourth overall that year, the best ever British placing. At the time it wasn't a big thrill because I'd done so much work to get there that it was just normal. It was just like going to the shops and buying something. It was just, it was like, it was like that for me. But afterwards I realized how important it is. But four years later, it was a different story. Miller furious at the finish after riding off the course when he mistakenly followed the signals of a policeman who was actually directing team cars. Yeah, I think it's happened. Thanks. More ridiculous things will happen uh, in Tour of France. And this is it, Bob's Corner, with two policemen standing on it this year to make sure there are absolutely no mistakes. Now, just to update you on Robert Miller's situation, you'll remember his team, Le Groupe Mon, was forced to fold because of financial problems the week before the Tour. Well, the good news is that a bank guarantee lodged with the UCI cycling's ruling body means that Robert will be paid for the rest of the season. And the UCI has also issued a special dispensation to allow the riders in that team to race without a team sponsor. What will happen is that all the Le Groupe Mon team, Luc LeBlanc, the world champion, Robert and everybody else, will race in plain white jerseys for the rest of the season in the hope of landing a contract elsewhere for 1996 if they do well enough. All right, back to the race on the road and in the wet now is Phil and Paul. So thanks, Gary, and we're on our way to you now. We're at the five-kilometre point to the finishing line, and Marco Pantani being chased here by Laurent Madouas, and Madouas has been chasing him, in fact, uh, since the previous climb where he attacked on the Col d'Agnès, and it was on that climb where Pantani consolidated his lead. Madouas went over the top there, second, 45 seconds back. Richard Verenc bringing over Miguel Indurain and his teammate Aparicio, and the news on that climb was that Tony Rominger had been dropped and was two minutes, 50 seconds behind. But on the descent, a very, very dangerously wet descent indeed, more problems for the television motorbikes. They crashed in the Alps and they were down again in the Pyrenees. But now we are with the chase group here on the final climb of the day. And once again, we're sorry about the picture breakup, but it is the atmospherics in the Pyrenees. They're climbing up towards again more fog as Aparicio, who rejoined this group after a bit of a chase, is now helping out Miguel Indurain. Just two riders ahead of the yellow jersey on the climb. Well, for the moment, the time is not being pulled back on Marco Pantani. He's actually increasing his lead as he comes up the climb of Guzenez. He's three minutes ahead of the yellow jersey group of Miguel Indurain at the moment. And still in the middle there is Laurent Madouas, the Frenchman from the Casarama team at 1 minute 25. He's doing a superb ride, but he isn't getting anywhere near this man. And although it seemed on the Port de l'Air that Indurain was going to be in for a really tough uh, session today, he's calmed the whole thing down and it's even an added bonus because they've seen Tony Rominger crack wide open and fall away from this group today. Bjorn Aris is still there, there he is, in the red jersey, champion of Denmark, they're under the five kilometre to go banner. Richard Varenk is here, Laurent Brochard. And uh, there's Claudio Chiapucci, so he recovered well from that punctured back wheel. And there's another Marco Pantani supporter letting him know what the gap is, and it is in fact increasing dramatically. One minute and 47 seconds, and Bjarne Reese, in fact, is attacking again from the yellow jersey group. 
Well, our camera's staying with the French rider, but news reaching our ears that Bjorn Rees has attacked from that injuring group, and now we're at the back of that group, and let's have a look. Yes, somebody's certainly gone. Injurain again continues to make the tempo at the front as our cameraman scampers up to see Bjorn Arise on the attack here on the climb of Guzenej. Well, Bjorn Arise here obviously not attacking Miguel Injurain. What he wants to do is put Laurence Jalabert into difficulty. He saw that Jalabert was dropped on the last climb there and he may well have changed his bicycle to get a lighter bicycle to go into this final climb, you know, so that he could get away from Laurence Jalabert and move back up into third place in the overall standings. He has to get two and a half minutes, though, in the overall overall standings today if he can jump up to third place well even a slight reduction of the gap and finish it off in the next couple of days perhaps but look at that acceleration there's been no reaction whatsoever injuring isn't going to start the reaction why should he because after all he's six minutes ahead of Bjorn Aris and we're looking at about three and a half kilometers to the end of this day of racing you can almost feel the pain there of Laurent Madwas as he goes around that corner. It's very steep in the corners and the riders will change down and try and accelerate. Two kilometres from the summit for Marco Pantani, just over a mile to the finish. And uh, back in the mountains, this man has come into his own once again. He's going to steal a little bit of time today. He's being chased still by Laurent Madwas. And then we go back to the people who are racing for third place, led, of course, by the man in yellow on his 31st birthday, Miguel Injurain. Just behind him, we have Alex Zula. And now trying to get on, I think it's Ivan Gotti. Now, do not forget that Ivan Gotti started today and just one second behind Tony Rominger. Well, those gaps will be minutes tonight because Rominger has been dropped from this group. Slips it up, just one little sprocket there to try and continue at the pace. There's Indurain Zula, and they've caught Bjorn Reese. There he is, and he's now just going to hang on. So we've got the first, second, and fourth place here, and the sixth place because Gotte, number 17 on the left, he will now be up to sixth place in the Tour de France. He'll have gone over Tony Rominger. Two kilometres to go for this group. Laurent Madras on the final hairpin bends of the climb of Guzé Neige, but he's still not making any progress at all on Marco Pantani, and he may well only just hang on by the chase back being uh, caused by Miguel Indurain. And that's the sight he wanted to see. One kilometre to go for Marco Pantani. Now it gets a little bit easier here, and then he climbs up to the finishing line. We're heading up now to the corner where Robert Miller went the wrong way a few years ago and lost the stage of the Tour de France because of it. One thing we do have to say, though, that even if Marco Pantani does go the wrong way, he's got enough time in hand to come back on himself and still win the stage. Yes, uh, that time with Robert, it was a three-man sprint with Philippe Bouvatier, and Massimo Girotto and Miller. Now, this time, it is just one man and himself, Marco Pantani. Remember Dalp Duez, of course, he almost went into where they send the cars uh, to park just before the finishing line, but he turned round uh, and went straight up to the finish of Dalp Duez. Very similar thing could happen here, to sharp left into the finish. Well, I have to admit, we were so lucky in having this man at the Tour de France. He was nearly robbed of his start here, but it's so good to have him. Yes, an injured knee which kept him out of his home tour, the Tour of Italy. It's meant he's come to the Tour de France quite fresh. He started uh, below form for sure, and he said he wasn't his old magic self, but he's certainly made amends now. He came good in the Alps, and it looks as though he's going to be even better in the Pyrenees. There are still two more stages in the Pyrenees to come after the day off tomorrow. The final gear change for Marco Panton, and he's made the right turn as well. Now he can line up for the finish, and he can collect his second stage in the mountains. He won in the Alps on the revered Alp d'Huez, and now he will win at Guzé Neige. A long day in the saddle, almost four and a half hours, and Pantani still looking so good as he sprints clear. There'll be good time gains for him today as well. As he comes up through the Merck to the line to the applause of a very appreciative crowd. Back lower down the slopes as Indurain is now picking up, I think, Laurent Madwas. He's realised it. Can you believe this, Paul? This man was clear. And now he's looked over his shoulder, and perhaps we can too. And there in the distance, you can see the chase back. That is amazing. He's been in front of Miguel Indurain's group for over 20 kilometres, but once Miguel decides that he wants to turn on the pressure, he really opens up that throttle and he closes down almost anything. 
Well, poor old Laurent Madwas, he rode so well and did so much, but he's hit the wall just before the top. It's not all over yet, he might hang on because the road gets a little bit easier before they climb up to the line. I don't think he's going to hold on today, but he will be happy, I think, by the fact that he's almost certainly going to move up in the overall standings. He went to the Tour of Italy with a hope of finishing in the top ten. He didn't do that, he finished 11th, but this ride today may well push him up into the top ten in the Tour de France. So France are finding themselves another big name in the sport here, as well as Laurent Jalabert. A little bit of a downhill before they climb up to the line, but you can see by the face of Madwas that he really is just hoping that line comes pretty quickly. 400 metres to go, he should hang on now, surely, although it's a pretty hard 400 metres. Well, he's suffering 350 metres to go, you know, he may well just hold on to that second place which he was hoping for, he was hoping to get up into contact with Marco Pantani, but nobody was going to touch that Italian today. And the last look over his shoulder, maybe just chance for a little smile, Laurent, because you're going to hold them off, I think. And there they are, goodness me, Indurain is after him, so too is Bjorn, and on the wheel of Indurain, of course, Indurain went very wide there. Ivan Gotti is here at the back of this group now, the big man grits his teeth, 31 years of age, out of the murk comes Laurent Madwas. The clock continues to count on, they've made, uh, Pantani's made good time gains, but Indurain will chase everything, he's trying to get Madwas just before the line, and look at this now, Madwas, he's got nothing left at all, but he's going to get it, oh, just 2 minutes 30, and not 2 seconds has gone by before Indurain uh, snatches third place, followed by Zula, Gotti and Reese in that order. Marco Pantani gets stage win number two in the mountains, finishing alone ahead of Laurent Madwas, who just held off a fast-finishing Miguel Indurain and Alex Zula. Further down the result, Laurent Jalabert used his sprint to beat the other Frenchman, Richard Berenc. And the man who suffered most today, well, that was Tony Rominger. He paid for an early attack by losing over five and a half minutes by the line. I wonder if you'll think of pulling out tomorrow. So Pantani is the angel of the mountains now, and he could win again. There's another finish in the Pyrenees on Tuesday. No change among the top four overall, but Ivan Gotti has climbed up to fifth place. Pantani is up to seventh, and Rominger goes down to eighth, but over 12 minutes back. Another cake for Miguel tonight, but although he seems able to snuff out his rivals in this race, the candles prove a little more difficult. Congratulations also due to our competition winner, it's Kim McEwen from Dunmurray in Belfast. Kim, a set of leaders' jerseys will be on the way to you very shortly. Well done. And not surprisingly, thousands of you opted today for Marco Pantani. Tomorrow the riders have their day off, but we don't. We'll have a programme for you tomorrow night at 6.30. We'll have a look back over the second week of the tour. We'll also tell you whether or not Tony Rominger decides to carry on. And as we say goodbye tonight, We'll have a look back now at a few of the more light-hearted moments of the Tour de France, as seen by Gary Imlach. Goodbye. The Tour started with Jackie Giron in two yellow jerseys to keep out the wind. By week two, though, he was out of the lead and most of his kit as the race began to hot up. He wasn't the only exhibitionist, either. Liggett showed a leg on American television, Jean-Francois Bernard kept a coachload of riders amused with his on the transfer day. Not everyone was quite so communicative, though. With the tour slipping away, so was Tony Rominger's grasp of English. Only John. Today only John. Tomorrow this will be a <laughs> The Russian Evgeny Berzin showed that the Berlitz lessons hadn't been completely wasted as he abandoned. No. Meanwhile, Max Chiandri, the Anglo-Italian rider, was happily holding a trilingual press conference after his first stage win. Afterwards, Mrs. Chiandri felt the need to put the record straight. Well, I'm the English mother. <laughs> After a hard week, many of the riders were happy to leave the Alps behind. And we leave you tonight with one of the reasons why. <laughs>